In 1 Corinthians uh, and in Thessalonians, we have this idea, it's better to be celibate, but if you can't hack celibacy, go ahead and get married. However, sex within marriage should be without passion, because that's for the dirty, dirty Gentiles. And it should be basically prophylactic. You only have enough sex to keep a, a lid on sexual desire. Not to say you must keep it at a, at a level zero at all times, but to say whenever it starts bubbling up, you don't want it to, to boil over. And so sex is really prophylactic within Paul's sexual ethic, but he would prefer people just didn't have it. Yeah, and, consider me team dirty, dirty Gentile <laughs> uh, on that one, but yeah. that's, that's just me. Hey everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we try to increase public access to the scholarly study of the Bible and religion and combat misinformation about the Bible and religion. How are you today, Dan? I'm doing great. I'm uh, just I'm just ready to to combat some misinformation or <laughs> ex, you know. Expose people to scholarship. You never know what what's going to happen here. Little from column A, little from column B. We're gonna, we're little, gonna get... yeah, exactly. And this week we are we're we're having some fun. We're we're only doing one segment mm -hmm. because it's an important uh, issue. It's a complex issue. It, it's a difficult one, and uh, and and we're we're gonna dive into it head first. Okay, are we not? We are. All right. So Dan, Dan, what are we talking about? Uh, I think today we're going to be talking about uh, homosexuality in the Bible. Uh oh, uh, Scun dun dun. Yeah, something that comes. Brace up, yourselves. <laughs> comes Everybody up all the time. Buckle up. Yeah, <laughs> my uh, my family and I watched Airplane last night. Uh, we I was uh, just stumbling around HBO Max, and they happened to have Airplane on there, and I was like, awesome. So um, yeah, I got to introduce my kids to a show that I grew up uh, <laughs> just. Loving so, I don't and know. But you, you reminded me of that. The, um, the uh, buckling so, up. Well, buckling up, but dun dun dun. Also, oh yes, um, exactly. The, <laughs> all the things. Yeah, all the things. And don't call me Shirley. The, yeah, that's the. <laughs> my daughter loved that. <laughs> all right. So, um, yeah. go ahead. Good lord, we are just on top of each other today. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's a mess. So let's let's start with. Uh, I, I think we need to start with sort of a basis, uh, so ground us in what we're talking about in yeah. terms of sexuality, in terms of uh, you know biblical times. Mm -hmm. Help us out with that. Well, I want to start with trying to explain that anciently they thought and talked about sexuality and organize their society around sexuality very, very differently from the way that we do today. And so when in our public discourse and discussions with other people in the ways that we think about sexuality, uh, science and our culture and media and a bunch of other things have, have kind of created the the structures that we use to kind of give flesh to the skeleton of what sexuality is, what human sexuality is, including homosexuality. And anciently, they did it in a very different way. And when we look at the biblical text and we superimpose those frameworks, those uh, interpretive lenses, if you will, that we use today, if we superimpose them on the biblical text, we are going to distort what those authors were trying to do with their texts. We are going to misunderstand how they thought and talked about sexuality. And so I want to provide a couple of insights from the broader study of sexuality in the ancient world to help us kind of reorient our thinking. And one of the main things that I think we need to understand is that we, we try to think of, of sexuality today, sexual relationships, as reciprocal, as uh, equal partnerships, as two people doing something together, and this is—I mean, ideally, that's what ideally, we want to yes, think of it. This, yeah. <laughs> aspirationally, that's what we would like everyone to um, to uh, how we would like people to talk and think about sexuality, and it was much less so anciently. In the ancient world, there was a social hierarchy of domination. And one of, and um, 
I'm I'm still trying to find the right terminology for this, but I refer to a, a social hierarchy of domination and penetration. Although I'm going to use when I refer to to this later on to be a little more uh, uh, a little more discreet. I'm going to talk about uh, active slash insertive um, roles versus mm. passive slash receptive roles. But anyway. Um, Sexuality was not something that two people did together. It was something that one person did to another person, someone lower down on that social hierarchy of domination and penetration. Uh, the roles, the social roles, sat a lot closer to the surface and were a lot more uh, were a lot more normative. They were a lot more important to how people uh, function socially. And so men, particularly freeborn um, citizen men in most societies in the first millennium BCE, were at the very top of the social hierarchy of domination and penetration. And there was, and, and then you had grades below that. Uh, you had men who may not be freeborn, uh, slaves were below that, women uh, were below that, children were below that. There were a lot of different ways this hierarchy could be structured, but across ancient Southwest Asia, the cultures that we are going to be talking about, freeborn citizen men were at the very top of that social hierarchy. And for a freeborn citizen man, to take a, a role that might be considered submissive uh, or subordinate within a sexual relationship was considered to violate that hierarchy, which was problematic. Um, and this is manifested in a lot of different ways. And I, I think one of the most interesting ways that is, is something when we think about sexual propriety today, we don't really get too upset about this, but anciently, if a man was on the bottom during intercourse with his wife, that was considered inappropriate. And we have ancient Mesopotamian texts that talk about how that renders a man ritually impure for a month. Um, and we have a, a, a Talmudic text that actually says that uh, that will give a man uh, diarrhea. So, <laughs> Wow. And okay. so that this is how didn't see that coming to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but uh, there's a there's a guy named David um, Hayward who does a uh, uh, I think he calls himself uh, he does a cartoon I think it's Naked Pastor cartoon. Mm. Um, they're pretty basic drawings, but uh, he did he did one where it was a a woman was was on top. They're in bed, you know. They got the blankets covering them, but uh, I think the man stops her and says, wait a minute, is woman on top biblical? And it's a and it's a joke, but uh, I responded to when he tweeted this out, I was like, probably not. Yeah. Because of this- Disturbingly, no. Yeah. This social hierarchy meant that for a man to take a submissive, even just sexual position in a, uh, a socially acceptable um, act of sexual intercourse was considered problematic. Well, it's a darn good thing that many thousands of years later, we have evolved so that nobody has these kinds of thoughts anymore. <laughs> I can't believe, I, I honestly can't believe how much I encounter this kind of thinking still today. Like, yeah. we still see it in a lot of, you know, this alpha male, uh, uh, you know, dominating blah, blah, blah. Hear it a lot, interestingly, from people calling themselves incels. So, like, you know, if if, if, if you're saying you're involuntarily celibate, and and yet you have big feelings about who's supposed to be on top and who's supposed to be dominating and who's supposed to be you know important. Uh, maybe you may maybe find a link there. Yeah, is all I'm saying. Well, and and I think it's it's interesting. It it's uh, because the people who are the most concerned about it are the people who are also most adamant that there is something essential about gender roles. Right. When it's like you all you ever talk about is the performativity. Of gender roles, yeah, and so you are acknowledging that gender is something that you do, not something that you are, right? Um, which, yeah, the uh, and and just the obliviousness of folks who who uh, try to um, try to have their cake and eat it too, um, regarding that is just yeah, laughable. just just the concept of saying, oh, you guys are all beta males, I'm an alpha <laughs> male, and all these other guys are beta male. Well, 
if there's that many beta males, then that's part of masculinity. That's part yeah. of maleness, isn't yeah. it? Question mark. Yeah. Are you going to compartmentalize it up? Is there are there grades <laughs> of masculinity? Right. If so, then it's not that binary. Right. Um, exactly. But this idea that's this this notion of a, a social hierarchy of domination and of penetration, it is still active today, but we see it back in uh, the end of the second millennium BCE, the beginning of the first millennium BCE in Mesopotamia. We see it in Talmudic literature a thousand years later. We see it in um, the alphabet of Ben Sirah, which is a medieval text written somewhere between probably the year 700 and 1000 B, or excuse me, CE. Mm. Um, and this text, this tells the story of uh, where Lilith came from. And according to this text, Lilith was Adam's first wife in the Garden of Eden, and she didn't want to be on the bottom. She wanted to be on the top. That, this is all the text says. She, Interesting. She refused to be on the bottom. She said, I wanted to be on top. And Adam said, it's not in your nature to be on top. Uh, and she gets upset and storms out of the, the Garden of Eden. And then she says, I'll tell you what's in my nature. Thank you very much. Yeah. And, and she leaves. And then God sends these three angels after her to try to convince her to come back to the Garden of Eden. And she's like, I'm not doing it. And I'm going to, I'm going to go be this, uh, succubus that's going to, uh, I'm going to afflict newborn babies and I'm going to, uh, give men, uh, wet dreams and things like this. And uh, I'm going to, the only way that I, babies will be protected from me is if they're wearing an amulet with the names of these three angels on them. And this, huh. is, this is likely a very complex etiology for why people were using amulets on their babies to try to protect them from evil spirits. Uh, huh. But Lilith... The first wife of Adam uh, is is one of the main ones of these evil we spirits. We may have to talk about Lilith at some point. Oh yeah, we'll sure. definitely need to talk about Lilith. Lilith, excuse me. But yeah. you can you can see that this is socially salient. This is something that people are aware of, and something that is important within literature, within society for thousands of years. Yeah. Um, and so, this is what's governing what people think of as appropriate and inappropriate sexual acts is this hierarchy of domination and penetration. And there are a lot of other aspects of it, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, incest and, and other things like that, there are boundaries around that as well. But when it comes to why in the first millennium BCE they're getting, uh, they're not happy about this idea of male same-sex intercourse, that's the primary uh, driver of this uh, of rationalizing why it's wrong. Um, I, I want to take a step back for a second, though, and say that the, the primary driver is an intuitive one, is a, this just kind of subconscious uh, intuitive aversion to the idea of male same-sex intercourse on the part of those who are not oriented in that direction. Right. Um, and so that's going to bubble to the surface socially as that kind of ickiness. This is weird. We don't like this. Uh, and then you have to come up with a reason why. You have to explain why it's wrong, it's bad. And the explanation right. that um, is most central to most of the rationalizations is this idea of this hierarchy of domination and penetration. Yeah, it does feel like there is a... Uh, I mean, when, when that power uh, differential is has any kind has when there's anything that sort of causes someone to question it or causes someone to uh to flip it on you know when it's flipped on its head in any way it seems like that's when people start to really freak out yeah and so and 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 so when they you know when it makes sense to me that when somebody encountered an act that seemed to be non-normative in terms of the uh the power differential, even if it's just something as intimate as two people having sex in the way that they want to have sex, mm -hmm. uh, I can see how that would kind of uh, kind of upset some folks. Yeah, and and I want to add that I think I would say that the size of the society involved has something to do with how acceptable versus unacceptable these things are. If uh, because a larger society is going to be uh, stronger socially, but you're going to have a lot more interactions between people who live very, very different lives. The smaller soci the society, the kind of more um, uh, homogenous things are. 
And so the more shocking uh, something that is non-normative is going to be to that society. Whereas a larger society like the empires of Egypt and of Mesopotamia and places like that, you're just exposed to a lot more difference and a lot more pluriformity, a lot more diversity. And so things that would shock small towns are not going to be as shocking. And so there tends to be more tolerance because people have more experiences with these things and they're not new, they're not different, and they're not as icky. Right. And so when we look in the legislation of the rest of ancient Southwest Asia, we really don't see any concerns with, there, there's no legislation that is prohibiting same-sex intercourse. Interesting. Uh, the, the closest you get is a middle Assyrian law that it's a little difficult to interpret, but what it seems to be saying is if a, uh, a freeborn citizen man, uh, and we're not sure if this is coerced, if it's forced, or if it's consensual, uh, engages in an act of same-sex intercourse with another freeborn citizen man, they have victimized the, the other freeborn citizen man. And when it, when it talks about engaging in the act, what it means is that the original, the first freeborn citizen man, taking the active slash insertive role and victimizing the man who is taking the receptive slash insertive, or sorry, recept, uh, passive slash uh, receptive role. Right. Um, it was understood as more natural for someone to seek out another body to penetrate. It was considered more unnatural for someone to, a man to seek out someone else to, um, to take the insertive role with them. And mm -hmm. so there were, there were different um, values associated with each role. And I think that's, that's also important to keep in mind that these two different roles, the active slash insertive role and then the passive slash receptive role, they had different explanations for each of these and the two were kept very separate. They were compartmentalized. Okay. So it wasn't, they didn't have anything remotely like our modern concept of a homosexual orientation or sexual orientation in general. That's something that we've developed, our understanding of it today has developed since the 19th century. They absolutely had people we would describe today as having a, a homosexual orientation or a bisexual orientation or other kinds of orientations. But yeah, when, they, when they thought and talked about those, those people, they described what they were doing in very different ways, and they, um, they reasoned about their motivations in very different ways. Right. Um, and so the one who sought out other men um, to, uh, to penetrate, that was considered a little more understandable and a little more normative, uh, whereas the one who sought out um, the receptive slash passive role, that was considered a, uh, an aberrancy. I don't even know if that's a word, uh, aberrant. <laughs> that was considered more of a pathology. And so those people were considered to be victims and to be victimized, and it was... It was, they would never think of someone seeking that out. They would only yeah. think of somebody else victimizing them in that way. It um, is interesting how, uh, <laughs> how little imagination some people had about what people might want. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody bases their understanding of what everybody else wants on assumptions that everybody wants the same thing yeah. as, right. as them. So, um, and they, if needed, you, they needed an internet is what they needed. <laughs> They'd learn yeah. real quick what people want. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, ju I just want to point to a handful of, of books um, because uh, that, that people can go look at if they want to research this more for themselves, because I'm kind of distilling this down to my understanding of what is ultimately a complex field. Um, right. And so some really good book, uh, book, books, uh, Ruby Blondell and Kirk Ormond, uh, edited a book called Ancient Sex, New Essays uh, from 2015. That is um, is a good one. Bernadette Bruton's 1996 book, Love Between Women, Early Christian Responses to Female Homoeroticism uh, is an excellent book. Um, Lewis Crompton from 2003, Homosexuality and Civilization is a good book. A really good book is uh, Benjamin Dunning's book, The Oxford Handbook of New Testament Gender and Sexuality. Um, mm. 
That's a really good one. Judith Hallett and Marilyn Skinner's 1997 book, Roman Sexualities uh, for the, uh, the Roman World. And then Thomas Hubbard in 2014 published a book called A Companion to Greek and Roman Sexualities. That's really good. So just for general kind of background about ancient sexuality, those are some, um, some good texts. Another one. Wonderful. Mark Masterson from 2015, Sex in Antiquity, Exploring Gender and Sexuality in the Ancient World. All which, right. So which, with so that's a background. Oh, yeah. That's a foundation. Let's yeah, we can move on. But from there. we've we've got to dive into this in, into the Bible here. We gotta we gotta get biblical with this thing. So yes. With all with all of that as the sort of the uh, background uh, of what's going on, let's get into what the, what people say about the Bible and what what the Bible says itself. So yeah, a lot of people. Matter of fact, it's very interesting. Just this morning, a friend of mine posted a thing on Facebook where she was talking about how she reached out to her parents' new church to ask about their views on uh, the LGBTQ uh, people in in because you know she's she's queer mm-hmm. and wanted uh, to know what her mom's new church was going to say about people like her. And they wrote back and said, we follow the Bible exactly, and therefore we are against gay people. Mm -hmm. That's the thrust of it. Uh, So when they they talk about following the Bible exactly or whatever, you know, you and I have discussed plenty of times that there's, the Bible doesn't say one thing about almost anything. Right. uh, But, there are a lot, there are some very, very prominent verses that, uh, that lots of Christians use mm-hmm. to, uh, to, to justify or, or to, uh, the word justify isn't what I want to say here, that support their idea that yeah. gayness is not okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we'll, we can start with Genesis, uh, just in Genesis 2. At the very end of the chapter, this is you know the second a- account of the uh, of the creation, mm-hmm. and uh, you know Adam has just God has just created Eve for Adam. Adam has said she's flesh of my flesh. This is great, mm-hmm. and it says uh, in verse twenty four. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they became they become one flesh. Yeah. Which seems to indicate that this is making that it is uh, that's that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, not that not that either Adam or Eve had a father and mother to leave, <laughs> but uh, but it does seem to be a uh, sort of prescription. It's it's used that way quite frequently, and and I think that goes back to. Um, the early centuries uh, after the New Testament, at least. I don't think we see this passage being used as a uh, prescriptively regarding marriage uh, in, shoot, during the New Testament. But today we see it used all the time as this prescribes what marriage is. It is between one man and one woman, and that's how it's used. However, there's nothing prescriptive about the text. It is a thoroughly descriptive text, and specifically one that's functioning as an etiology. It's not, um, and you can already tell that it's, it's looking backwards. It's talking about a man who doesn't have a father and a woman who doesn't have uh, a father or a mother. Uh, it's talking about the two of them, and then it basically says, and this is why we do this now. Right, and so it's just describing the origins of that. It's it, in a sense, this is kind of uh, an Aesop's tale mm. of why it is that uh, a man will leave his parents' household, and a woman will leave her parents' household, and they will create their own household. And this is this is an etiology for independent kinship units. Why a man will go off and start his own household, and it, the explanation is basically. Since woman was taken out of man and they originate in a single body, then it's natural for the two of them to come together and and form uh, a single body, an independent kinship unit, an independent household. However, this text is also being written in a time period when polygamy 
was perfectly normative, where yeah. men who had the the money, the the resources, were not prohibited, frowned upon in any way, shape, or form whatsoever um, from taking additional wives. Yeah, uh, I'm so always I'm always baffled by people saying, you know, I believe in biblical marriage, one man, one woman. Yeah, and it's just like, have you read anything in the Bible? Because yeah. there's, <laughs> you you remember Solomon? That's uh, that's not a one man, one woman situation. Yeah, and 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 so when you take this text prescriptively and say it therefore means one man, one woman, it's like, well, that this text was in circulation and was authoritative for several centuries, while it was frequently one man and multiple women, uh, and they had their independent relationships with uh, the man and and uh, one of their given wives, but a man could be married to, to multiple different women. And in the Bible, the Bible even describes God as arranging some of these marriages. Uh, God tells David, I have given you many, your master's many wives. Uh, and this is a divine endorsement of polygamy. And so to read this prescriptively is a renegotiation of the text, and one that is intended to rationalize, legitimize, authorize uh, a, a post-biblical worldview, whatever that may be, whether that's the early, um, early Christians uh, trying to rationalize why they didn't like polygamy anymore, or whether that's someone today trying to explain why they don't think that um, two men or two women ought to be able to marry each other. Right. So that's well, yeah. all right. So, so that's not prescriptive. But then we get to Gen uh, Genesis nineteen, mm -hmm. uh, which we've already talked about. We have this is Sodom and Gomorrah. They get destroyed, and the order of events could very easily lead one to believe that the reason that it is destroyed, that these cities are destroyed, is that uh, everything was so debauched in these cities. That men were like the one thing we hear about in the story specifically is angels come into the city and a mob gathers to want to rape them. Yes. Uh, presumably men wanting to rape these men. Yes. And uh, so that seems pretty solid. Like it seems, <laughs> if you draw the lines, it feels like what that story is about is. Men wanting to rape other men, and God destroys the city. It's the the fact that the the threatened sexual assault is between two agents of the same sex is kind of incidental. Um, well, it's not totally incidental. Uh, if the main characters were women and they went into the city, and all the men gathered around and said bring out the the two women because you know we we want to know them we're going to sexually assault them would you then say well turns out heterosexuality is obviously the problem in this story no you wouldn't say that so it doesn't it doesn't make sense to say well because they're men and they're wanting to sexually assault other men the problem is the fact that they're they're both men. No, the problem is the threatened sexual assault. And the reason it is significant in the story is because in the Bible, you wouldn't really have a story where the angels are women or where women are the main character, because most of the time there are some rare exceptions, but they don't have to do with, uh, with this kind of scenario. Most of the time, women are kind of NPCs in the Bible. <laughs> They yeah. are not full autonomous persons. They are not fully autonomous agents unto themselves uh, in the Bible, and certainly not in, in sexual situations either. They are the uh, the passive agent. They are the one who is acted upon uh, in a in a sexual encounter. And so, what, very lucky to be even get a name in the Bible. <laughs> it, yeah, if they if they are named, um, they are they are certainly in the minority. And so, one of the rhetorical points, one of the ways that they're showing the depravity of, of Sodom is to show that the men of the city are going to forcefully overturn that social hierarchy of domination and penetration, and basically 
force the male angels into a submission, a submissive subordinate sexual act. And basically, that, that's a way to shame, to dominate, and to um, disgrace these men who are, uh, according to the narrative, who are angels. And so it's not just a threat of sexual assault, it's also a threat of violating their status, their station as men, to say, we are going to um, you know, overturn that, that hierarchy. And, and you see the same kind of, of threats today when, when men are uh, emasculated or feminized in rhetoric today. It's doing the same kind of thing. Um, if, uh, and there are a bunch of different ways that, that men today try to feminize or emasculate other men to try to assert their dominance over them. And so it's, it's the same kind of thing. And as we discussed in the previous, when we discussed this, um, in a previous episode, we have a, a very similar story in Judges 19, where again, the, the problem there is not, um, oh, this is men wanting to have sex with men. The problem is this is men sexually assaulting. And this is men using the threat of sexual assault as a means of shaming, of disgracing, of emasculating, of overturning um, that hierarchy of domination and penetration. So the problem here is not the fact that this is men who have, want to have sex with other men. In fact, in the Judges 19 story, they end up sexually assaulting the man's concubine, the woman. And that's still cause for concern for that man. Uh, he's pretty callous and heartless in the morning, stepping over the the dying concubine and telling her to get up because they're in a hurry uh, before finally cutting her up into 12 pieces and sending these pieces to the 12 tribes of Israel. Not to say, hey, these men tried to have sex with another man, but to say, look what they did to to my concubine they sexually assaulted ultimately what is my property. Um, and so that's still a very, very bad thing for um, within that story. So when you try to reduce it to a, a threat of uh, same-sex intercourse, uh, you're misreading the story, you're misunderstanding it, um, because it's far more than that. It's about social status, it's about social position, it's about the use of the threat of sexual assault. All right. All right. That's I, I hear you on that point, but <laughs> now it's time to get into some laws. We're going to Leviticus. We're yeah. gonna lay down some real laws here. And uh and it feels pretty definitive. So I'm I'm eager to hear what you have to say about it because yeah. Leviticus 18 uh verse 22 says, You shall not lie with a male. As with a woman, mm -hmm. it is an abomination. Yeah. Uh, and Leviticus 20, 13 says something similar. It says, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall be put to death. Their blood guilt is upon them. Yeah. That's pretty hardcore. It's, it's pretty harsh. Um, it is... It is a part of uh, these, these two chapters that discuss... Uh, basically laws regarding sexual relationships. And there's a lot to the context that, that we need to talk about here. The first thing I want to say, however, is there, there are some folks who make the argument that this is a reference to uh, that the word zahar at the beginning, et zahar lo tishkav, means then with a male you shall not lie. There's an argument that zahar refers to uh, young men, to boys, to, mm. to youth. And there's not really anything that supports this argument. I think that is a conclusion in search of an argument. Zahar just <laughs> means male, generically, and unless it is qualified in some way, the most stereotypical male within this society and within the texts that use this word is an adult uh, citizen male. Um, mm. So a man, a man. So this is a this is not a reference to pedophilia. This is a reference to um, male same sex intercourse. Now there there are other folks who want to draw from the context, which uh, some of the context has to do with acts that can be argued to be cultic 
in their nature, in their context. Mm. And so some people want to try to take that reading and impose that context onto these passages and say, well, we need to understand this in the context of cultic acts. Therefore, this is prohibiting cultic sex between two men. So maybe this is about cultic prostitution or something like that. That is also an argument that I don't think has much support. I don't think the scholarship is in um, is in support of that argument. So these two passages, Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13, I think are very clearly prohibiting male same-sex intercourse, just generic male same-sex intercourse. Now, they understood it much differently back then. As I, as I stated, this is uh, sex is something that one agent does to another, and so they probably didn't think about this as uh, something that was mutual, something that was consensual on the part of both parties. And so in Leviticus 18.22, the prohibition is on the one who is taking the active slash insertive role. So what it is saying is, hey, you don't you go and um, have sex with another man as if he were a woman. In other words, don't take the active slash insertive role. So Leviticus 18.22 is, if we're gonna draw, if we're gonna try to draw clear lines about what this is prohibiting precisely, Leviticus 18.22 seems to be prohibiting taking the active role, the insertive role in an act of male same-sex intercourse, which is pretty limited when we think about all potential um, kinds of same-sex intercourse. That is a pretty limited uh, subsection of that. Now, Leviticus 20 verse 13 expands it and seems to identify the passive slash receptive role as culpable as well. Uh, there's an argument to make that Leviticus 20 is copying Leviticus 18, but then adding uh, condemnation of the other partner to this because there are a handful of passages in Leviticus 20 where it starts off in the singular, and then you awkwardly have this pivot to the plural in Leviticus. <laughs> and chapter 13, or not chapter 13, excuse me, and verse 13 is one of these examples where it starts off in the singular, and then the grammar suddenly is in the plural. And this is not standard in Hebrew. This is not how we usually do things. And so a lot of scholars think that Leviticus 18 is probably the original prohibition, and then somebody repeated these and say and said, no, we also need to impose the death penalty upon the other uh, partner in this act. So uh, some of the women who are mentioned who are having, you know, the Leviticus 18 says, hey, men, don't sleep with a person who is or a woman who is X, Y, or Z. Leviticus 20 then says, hey, men, don't sleep with a woman who is X, Y, or Z. And also the woman is killed as well. And so wow. we seem to have a later alteration of the standard here. Um, Whoever wrote Leviticus 20 was a grump. <laughs> <laughs> well, the what they seem to be doing is uh, both of these chapters seem to be concerned with maintaining the purity of the land because these these actions are uh, anciently were thought to have kind of created a me metaphysical contamination that went on to the land and literally defiled, rendered impure, contaminated the land. And the threat you see in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20 is that you're going to defile the land and the land is going to kick you out, is going huh. to, uh, you're going to be expelled from the land if you defile it too much. So um, when we go back to kind of intuitive concepts of, of morality and right and wrong, we all have kind of an inbuilt system of contamination, an understanding of what contaminates and, and what doesn't. And we're very sensitive to things that, um, that we intuitively feel like are contaminating. And this is one of the, reason, one of the reasons uh, most people don't have a problem smelling their own gas. Mm. But <laughs> as soon as they smell somebody else's, it's like, oh! <laughs> because we have this intuitive sense that this is getting into my body and this is going to contaminate me in some way, shape, or form. We all have a sense of, oh no, contamination. And so this is kind of rationalized. These, these moral, social indiscretions, the ways we're violating these um, compartments that have been set up for our social existence is being framed as 
something that creates a metaphysical contamination, and that's going to spill onto the land, and the land is going to kick us out. And so like the idea of uh, men not wearing women's clothes, women not wearing men's clothes, the idea of mixing fabrics, these are all violations of socially conventionalized compartments and boundaries, everything in its place. And if you spill over the boundary into the other compartment, oh no, that's a problem, that creates this kind of metaphysical concept of, of contamination, and therefore that's prohibited. So mixing fabrics, prohibited. Men wearing women's clothes, prohibited. Eating the wrong kinds of food, uh, they somehow they came up with um, compartments for different types of foods. These were okay, these other ones were not. But it's all based on this idea that if we're violating boundaries, that produces this contamination. And so Leviticus 18 seems to be saying, hey man, don't do that that creates this contamination. And then Leviticus 20 is saying, the other person is also creating the contamination, and so they also need to go. And that is how we purge the land of that contamination. Wow. Um, and so these two passages are condemning male same-sex intercourse. One, specifically the active slash insertive role. The other is saying, now we're gonna expand it to the other role as well. But it's still only male same-sex intercourse, and conspicuously, the Hebrew Bible nowhere says a single thing whatsoever about female same-sex intercourse. And if they extended this idea to females, they would have said something, because the very next verse in um, chapter 20, or no, both of them, chapter 18 and chapter 20, talks about um, bestiality. And there it explicitly says, guys, don't do this. Oh yeah, also women are also prohibited from doing this. Yeah. And so two things I wanna note there, if the problem were just same-sex intercourse across the board, this is all wrong and all for the same reason, women would have been included there. But they were not, conspicuously, they would have been. Yeah, if you've read Leviticus, you know, it's, it's thorough. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> they cover a lot of stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't think you'd need laws for. Yeah. Uh they cover a lot of stuff. So it you it would be weird for them to skip it. Yeah. Which means lesbians, you're totally good. And and there's and there's a stream of Jewish thought that has no issue with um with female same sex intercourse. Interesting, yeah. Um the other thing to note about the the next passage that talks about bestiality is that the only passage in these two chapters that prohibits women, or that prohibits the sexual partner that a woman can have, is the only passage that refers to a sexual partner that could possibly be below her on that hierarchy of domination and penetration, and that's because that sexual partner is an animal. Wow. In other words, we can tell that we're referring to people higher up on the on the hierarchy don't do this to someone else somewhere on that hierarchy because that's wrong and the only time that the agency of a woman is even considered is when that's about somebody lower on that uh, on that hierarchy because they are not the active agent in any other kind of sexual encounter they are the passive they are the one having it done to them except when the other um, entity is an animal. Wow. So um, it clearly well, that hierarchy is in play here. Yes. <laughs> oh. All right. You know what I think we should do is take a bit of a of a moment to uh, to cleanse our palates and uh, yes. and then we'll dive into uh, the New Testament and and see if we can make some sense out of that. Let's do it. Hey, everybody. Have you ever wondered how you can support the Data Over Dogma podcast? I mean, why wouldn't you wonder such a thing? Well, uh, you can become a patron of our show, uh, and that is a fairly easy thing to do. Go over to patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. I'll get it good, eventually. Good. Uh, dot com slash data over dogma. Uh, you can choose how much you want to give. It's a It's a monthly thing. And uh, your your contribution helps uh, foot the bill for everything that we have to do here, helps make the show go, and we sure would appreciate it if you'd consider becoming a patron. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so we've covered 
uh, the Old Testament. We've covered Levitical law. But let's get into the New Testament. Let's talk about uh, what Jesus' people had to say yeah. about all of this stuff. I think to start, however, we need to talk about the the sociocultural foundation of what's going on in the New Testament. What are they building on? And I think the argument is strong that they're building on a foundation of Greco-Roman period Jewish conventions, uh, and particularly in Paul. Paul is really the only one who's addressing uh, same-sex intercourse in the New Testament. And then the the person who is pretending to be Paul, who wrote 1 Timothy. And, um, <laughs> and that's <laughs> an issue. We're going to have to get into that We're going to have to do a, a whole, point. yeah, a segment on, on that in and of itself. But um, Paul seems to be writing from a perspective that is informed not only by Greco-Roman period Judaism, but also by some of the uh, philosophical traditions that were in circulation at the time. Now, Paul is not a textbook Stoic or a textbook Platonist, but Paul is clearly influenced by uh, some of the streams of Stoic, Platonist, probably Pythagorean ideas that were in circulation. Um, and so there were people who borrowed a little bit from here, a little bit from there, and kind of created their own uh, philosophical mashup. And, and I think Paul, there's a good case to make that Paul is one of them. Interesting. And when yes. we look at Greco-Roman period Judaism, some of the most representative texts are one, Philo of Alexandria, who talks a lot about philosophy and talks a lot about sexuality. Um, now, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, we saw that there was a concern for male same-sex intercourse. Female same-sex intercourse was conspicuously absent. In the Greco-Roman world, there was a... There was a, a place for same-sex intercourse, but it was primarily for male same-sex intercourse. Female same-sex intercourse was something that didn't really fit comfortably into their rationalization of male same-sex intercourse. Uh, I, I think the the most the easiest way to understand what was going on was men who were at the top of this hierarchy of domination and penetration were basically walking around. They were walking, talking hammers, looking for nails. Mm. And those nails could take a lot of different forms. And so basically you had the ideal of a penetrable body, and then you had other kinds of bodies that had different degrees of proximity to that ideal penetrable body. And so uh, young men, uh, prepubescent, were considered to be kind of close to that ideal penetrable body. And so within the broader Greco-Roman world, it was considered perfectly understandable and perfectly acceptable for men to have uh, young boys as lovers. And now frequently these would be, they were from lower social classes or they were slaves because it was considered inappropriate to engage in that kind of relationship with someone of uh, equal social status. Again, social hierarchy of domination and penetration. And so there was a carve out for that. It was understandable that a man would want to penetrate a body that was close to that ideal. Uh, and there, was, there were relationships that were considered inappropriate. Female same-sex intercourse, didn't really fit into that very well because nobody was really doing the, the the penetrating there. And so they didn't know where it fell on that hierarchy. And so you had um, female same-sex intercourse was there were aspects, parts of the society that considered it more acceptable, but for the most part, it was considered more of a pathology as would a man who sought out the passive slash receptive role in an act of male same-sex intercourse. So again, we have compartmentalized roles that are understood in very different ways and that had different degrees of acceptability within society. Now, on the Jewish side of things, uh, they were very conservative, and so they didn't like uh, same-sex intercourse at all. And Philo rationalizes it as a problem because it uh, it interrupts, it uh, obstructs procreation. And that's the primary purpose of sex. And so if you're not having procreative sex, it is inappropriate. 
there's some parity that is achieved between men and women in the sense that female same-sex intercourse is now condemned to the same degree that male same-sex intercourse is condemned, but the, the rationalizations are entirely different. Sorry, help me out with, who is this? Philo of, Ale- oh, um, uh, Philo of Alexandria is a Jewish philosopher who's writing at the end of the first century BCE and at the beginning of the first century CE. Actually, I think okay. probably mostly at the beginning of the first century CE. Um, and I want to say he dies um, around the, the same time period as Paul. Um, and he wrote tons and tons of texts, primarily commentaries on uh, the scriptures from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, And so Philo is one of our uh, most important uh, kind of windows into Greco-Roman period uh, Judaism, because he's doing a lot of commenting. And he was was also a a diplomat. He was sent on on missions to Rome to try to convince the emperor to to lay off uh, the people in Alexandria and Jerusalem and things like that. So um, so there are tons and tons and tons of work works by Philo of Alexandria. And if anybody is interested in um, looking this stuff up, there's a scholar named William Loder who has uh, published several texts on uh, sexuality in Philo, Josephus, and uh, the Testaments, the New Testament, the Pseudepigrapha, uh, done a lot of really, really good work on how uh, all these writers in this period address sexuality. And, and so... In the Greco-Roman period, Judaism was like, we don't like anything except for sex that is being done for the purposes of procreation. And and this is why they rationalized why uh, sex during menstruation was considered inappropriate in the Hebrew Bible. But they also extend it to uh, sex during pregnancy um, and other kinds of sex that is done for any reason other than procreation. And you had different degrees of... Uh, of severity. Some people were like, absolutely no sex whatsoever unless the po- the purpose is procreation. And other people who are like, eh, you know, sometimes it's okay. Um, <laughs> but but for the, the most harm, part- guys? Yeah. Calm down. But for the most part, we want to keep it to sex for the purpose of procreation. Um, Man, they were killjoys back then, I gotta say. <laughs> And uh, and part of this was because of this idea that developed within some Greek philosophical thought that sexual desire was a problem, that sexual desire was one of the um, kind of baser uh, passions that was symptomatic of our, uh, you know, corrupt fleshly existence. And so particularly within Platonism, but also within Pythagoreanism and to some degree within Stoicism, you wanted to um, you wanted to overcome the vicissitudes of the flesh and you wanted to uh, have a more spiritual experience. And so there were um, schools of thought that uh, like the idea of celibacy, because you were basically flatlining that sexual desire. You were not going to let that sexual desire bubble to the surface. You were going to keep it under wraps. I feel like we're transitioning to Paul. We're transitioning to the New <laughs> Testament because we do have in um, in Matthew and in Luke, we have this, uh, I don't know if you remember, but one of them asks about divorce and uh, Jesus is, you know, basically gives this um, this more strict rule and, and they're like, wow, it would be better not to get married. And Jesus is like, you know what? <laughs> and then says- Funny you, know, you should say that. Yeah. <laughs> says not this is a uh, this is a tough saying that not everyone can accept but then goes on to say there are men who are born eunuchs there are men who are made eunuchs by others and then there are men who make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven so that's Matthew 19 and most scholars would say this probably isn't talking about self castration mm-hmm. um, it probably means there are men who are swearing off sex. They are um, adopting a life of celibacy for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is like, I mean, you know, that's hardcore. Um, (laughs) Not everybody can accept that, but those who can, you know, got to hand it to them. Basically saying celibacy is, is a higher ideal. And this is, and this is what Paul is saying as well. Paul was an unmarried man and the majority of scholars would argue that Paul does not have a particularly mm, good 
understanding of, uh, or not good understanding, but Paul doesn't have a high view of the value of sex. And he talks about sex as something that is uh, problematic, that can get out of control, can be misdirected. Sexual desire can be misdirected very easily. Uh, and so in 1 Corinthians uh, and in Thessalonians, we have this idea basically that um, it's better to be celibate, but if you can't hack celibacy, go ahead and get married. However, sex within marriage should be without passion because that's for the dirty, dirty Gentiles. And it should be basically prophylactic. You only have enough sex to keep a, a lid on sexual desire. Not to say you must keep it at a, at a level zero at all times, but to say whenever it starts bubbling up, you don't want it to, to boil over. And so, you know, come over and <laughs> do whatever you got to do to get the, the, um, the, the boil back down uh, in the pot. And, wow. and so sex is really prophylactic within Paul's sexual ethic, but he would prefer people just didn't have it. Yeah, and, consider me team dirty, dirty Gentile <laughs> uh, on that one, but yeah. that's, that's just me. Yeah, and a lot of translations will, will render this passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians, I think it's 4.4, 4, maybe verse 5, uh, where it talks about not, uh, every man should possess his vessel in honor and holiness and not in, the Greek literally says, the passion of desire, like the Gentiles who don't know God. But a lot of translations will say lustful desire to make it sound like there's desire that's okay and there's desire that's that's lustful and inappropriate but Paul is is really saying no sexual desire no no passion of desire so well let's 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 stick with Paul but let's yeah. get to Romans 1 okay where Paul uh in in verses 26 and 27 Paul says this for this reason God gave them over to dishonorable passions their females exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural, and in the same way also the males, giving up natural intercourse with females, were consumed with their passionate desires for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received their own per re received in their own persons the due penalty of their for their error. Yeah. What are um, we talking about? Well, one note I want to make here is natural intercourse is an awful translation of the oh, okay. Greek because the Greek there refers to uh, the uh, utility, the usefulness of the women. So it says um, the men gave up the natural utility of their women and the women gave up their own natural utility. And what is the natural utility here? Well, Paul doesn't really care about procreation. Because Paul thinks Jesus is coming back too soon for any of that to matter, and he commands all of his congregations, stay in the circumstances, the life circumstances you were in when God, God called you. In other words, if you don't have kids, don't get pregnant. Um, so, wow. pro, so while Greco-Roman period Judaism was like sex is only for procreation, Paul was like, not even for that. <laughs> we don't care about procreation. And so the natural usefulness of a woman is just as a basically a sexual receptacle. And this is what possess your vessel means in, um, in Thessalonians. The vessel is the sexual receptacle that is a man's wife. Um, and so the idea here is that uh, men are giving up what a woman is good for in order to go engage in, in male same-sex intercourse. Women are giving up what they are themselves good for to go engage in uh, same-sex intercourse. Uh, and Paul is is basically adopting a pretty run of the mill idea from Greco Roman period Judaism that same sex intercourse, whether it is male or female, is wrong because it is uh, it's violating what uh, the purpose of sex was, which was procreation. But Paul can't really say that because Paul doesn't care about procreation. So Paul is just saying. This is nature. Nature says you're not supposed to do this. And, and what that means is basically when you look at genitals, what does it seem like they're there to do? Um, right. Therefore, that is natural. Therefore, if you're doing things unnatural, that is, um, that is bad. Now, another interesting thing to note about this is in Romans 1, Paul is talking about how the Gentiles... Um, refuse to acknowledge God, who is manifest within creation, and so they have no excuse. God is 
is testified to them by the natural world. And so they have refused to worship the creator and instead are worshiping the created things. And it says that um, that God gave them over to their passions. In other words, God puts a kind of a governor, a limit on these uh, these fleshly passions. And because they were not worshiping him, but were worshiping the created order, God said, all right, I'm taking the lids off and watch what happens. <laughs> and so basically their, their sexual desire is boiling over, is being misdirected, everything's going wrong to the degree that men are having sex with men, women are having sex with women. It's pandemonium everywhere you look. And so it's interesting that Paul is not saying, hey, don't do this. Paul is saying, the Gentiles worship the wrong thing and look what happened to them. So it's kind of using it as um, as kind of an illustration rather than a direct condemnation. Yeah, but, that feels a lot like a please don't throw me in the briar patch moment <laughs> <laughs> to me. But uh, but I think it's, it's interesting to note here that uh, folks who try to transfer Paul's ideology, sexual ethic from Romans 1 into today already are having to negotiate with Paul's sexual ethic because Paul didn't like sex at all. Paul right. was like, look, don't do it. Only get married if you can't hack celibacy and then just have enough, enough sex to, to keep down the, the urges. And nobody today thinks about sex that way within Christianity uh, among those people who consider Paul's writings authoritative. So they've already negotiated away the majority of Paul's sexual ethic. Uh, but for some reason, they take this as non-negotiable, even though we can account for the the conceptual, the philosophical uh, origins of this concern, and it's based on social hierarchies and conventions uh, that simply don't exist anymore. All right, let's look at some other uh, yes scriptures here. First uh, Corinthians six verses verse nine yes says. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, <clears throat> excuse me, women who engage in illicit sex, and then 10 goes on to say, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, swindlers, yeah. none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got, we, we've got sexually immoral... Uh, which seems to be a catch-all phrase, and we've got male prostitutes mm -hmm. and men who engage in illicit sex. Yeah, so we, we've got two words here in, in Greek, and they're one of them's a little easier to understand than the other. One of them is malachi or malakoi, according to the Erasmian pronunciation. And and it, it basically, to, to be um, a little crude, the, this would be translated as softies. And it's a reference to somebody who is uh, socially soft, which can refer to non-sexual um, kind of effeminate things, but here very certainly is a reference to men who take the passive or receptive role in an act of male same-sex intercourse. And then the next word is arseno kite, or according to the Erasmian pronunciation, arseno koitai, which would be men betters. And this is, a, this is a neologism. This is something that Paul invents, this word. And it seems to be taken from the Septuagint translation of Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20, uh, where arson um, is men, and that uh, arsenal koita is, is basically uh, men betters. And this would refer to the one who takes the active or the insertive role in an active male same-sex intercourse. So where Paul is, as with, uh, Leviticus 20 verse 13 is condemning both sides of this act of same-sex intercourse. However, it's still maintaining that compartmentalization, that the Malakoi are one group who are motivated by one thing, and then the arsenal Koitai are an entirely separate group uh, motivated by an entirely separate thing. And so these are, there is no versatile role in Paul's conceptualization of, of human sexuality which in um, my understanding, that is the majority of, of men who identify as homosexual today would identify as, as um, having a, um, preferring a versatile role rather than 
um, confining themselves to the insertive or the receptive role. And so the the understanding that we know about that. <laughs> The, the understanding that Paul has of human sexuality is outdated, inaccurate, and is based on this assumption that nature dictates the way it's supposed to be. And we know now that uh, nature is a little less binary than Paul would have it, uh, and that this is not something that is a choice. This is not something that uh, is fundamentally built on... Uh, the nurture side of the the nature nurture divide, but is something that is driven primarily by nature, uh, and so Paul's Paul's rationalization for why he supports the kind of traditional Greco Roman Jewish position on this is based on entirely outdated frameworks, and I know that First uh, Timothy is the other one that talks about this as well. And it only uses the word arsenokoitai. It does not use the other word. So we're back to just referring to the insertive role. Uh, but there's nothing different to address about that text. We've we've addressed this word already. So I think we can... Right. And also, First Timothy was not written by Paul. Again, something we can talk about in another <laughs> segment. But um, so I think we can, uh, we can consider First Timothy addressed as well. Sure. Uh, and then finally, there's there there there's Jude uh, who goes back to Sodom and Gomorrah, says likewise Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which in the same manner as they indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural lust, mm -hmm. uh, serve as an, as an example by undergoing punishment of an, of eternal fire. So the the unnatural lust there that's translating a, a Greek phrase. Um, I believe it is sarkosetras. Um, which actually means other flesh. Um, and while some people understand this to refer to unnatural sexual acts, uh, the context here, the verse before, the verse after, makes clear that we're talking about some kind of problematic relationship between humans and angels. And so what Jude 1.7 is condemning is humans wanting to have sex with angels. Because that does sound unnatural. It it is, and this is other flesh, like the sarcos heteras, hetera, hetero, hetero. Like it's it's very definitely not talking about um, same sex intercourse. Uh, but this is a debate that was going on at the time because we had we were having debates about Genesis six. The book of Enoch is talking about the angels, the fallen angels, and there were debates at the time about wait a minute. Can one, can angels disobey God? Two, are angels sexually compatible with humans? And so when Jude was being written, there were people on all sides of this question saying, no, angels aren't sexually compatible. They can't disobey. That must have been humans. And obviously the author here is reading Genesis 19 as a reflection of one of these inappropriate attempts to try to bridge the unbridgeable sexual gap between humanity and um, the angelic world. And so this is this has absolutely nothing to do with same-sex intercourse. This is a reference to humans uh, desiring inappropriate sexual relationships with divine entities. So the conclusion that we have to come to in all of this uh, is that we don't have to come to any specific conclusion, <laughs> I think. I think that... You know, there are definitely scriptures that have laws, you know, specifically those uh, Levitical laws against m at least male uh, homosexual acts. Mm -hmm. But uh, in order to hold to those, in order to say, to make the case that those are applicable to a modern society, it sounds to me like we have, you have to. You have to get past a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would argue that, one, uh, Leviticus is only about the land of Israel or the house of Israel. And so if you are not either Jewish and or living within the land of Israel, Leviticus has no application to you anyway. And so if you're wanting to leverage Leviticus, you're already renegotiating 
the text. You're already saying, I want to use this text just because I want to use this text, not because the text requires it of me. And, and the as other- so many people point out, like Leviticus also prohibits, you know, the eating of shellfish yeah. and the wearing of, of mixed uh, fabric clothing, all right. of that sort of stuff is is also condemned. If you do those other things, you're already rejecting Levitical law. Right. Yeah. So it is it is uh transparently a renegotiation. And additionally, with Paul, Paul is taking a very conservative stance. Uh, Paul is promoting a sexual ethic that has been overwhelmingly rejected by the modern world. Uh, celibacy is not something that the majority of people who who consider the Bible an authoritative text live. It's something there are some folks who who do that, but overwhelmingly, Paul's sexual ethic has already been negotiated away. The Bible is negotiable. There is nothing in here that cannot be negotiated away. Um, and even if you try to uh, lump it all together into one thing, say, we're going to take it all seriously, it is not univocal. It is not consistent. You're going to find contradictory um, aspects of, of trying to do so. And so everybody is already negotiating with the text. Much of that negotiation is driven by structuring power and values and engaging in boundary maintenance to serve the interests of one's social identities. Uh, and when we negotiate away part of Paul, but then say, no, this other part of Paul is non-negotiable, we're just doing that because it serves our interests. It makes the text meaningful or useful for us. And I would argue that we are well past the point when the lives of LGBTQ plus people are far more important than the deployment of these texts uh, to engage in identity politics or boundary maintenance uh, for the sake of um, your community. Uh, Very clearly, the lives of these people are uh, more important than that, and they are under threat. They are being marginalized, they are being devalued, and there is untold abuse and harm and and self-harm arising from the way people are trying to use these things to structure power. That will be renegotiated away sometime in the future. I personally don't have a doubt about that. I don't know how far in the distant future that will be, but the only thing that is stopping us from negotiating that final aspect of Paul's sexual ethic away is the fact that it's still useful for some people. And I think that is uh, pretty sad. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thanks everyone for listening. If you'd like to uh, become a a uh, patron of the show, you can go to patreon.com slash data over dogma. Uh, you can also uh, contact us if you wish to contact at data over is the email address. Dan, thanks so much for this. This was uh, a, a very enlightening episode. Well, thank you. I'm uh, I'm sorry for going on uh, a handful of rants there, but uh, <laughs> the rants I'd... are the important part. We you come you come for the rants, you stay for the <laughs> for the Bible stuff. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. We will talk to you again next week. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Mm-hmm.